um, as a NIH trained Fogarty Fellow. And she is doing this presentation because she is currently a visiting fellow, a visiting research fellow in the division. Um, she has an HIV research um, trust fellowship and also has some um, funding from LSH, LSHTM, um, a doctoral research traveling scholarship. So we're really thrilled to have Connie um, present today. She's doing very interesting work in Zimbabwe. Um, so she's going to tell us more about her PhD work. She's in the final stages of writing up and busy submitting papers and um, so it's really lovely to be able to have you speak to us, Connie, and we will um, take some questions afterwards. So please um, do take note of your questions and then we'll um, we'll take them at the end. So go ahead, Connie. Thanks very much and welcome. Amazing. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen and yeah, we'll take it from there. Perfect. Um, so thank you everyone for having me this afternoon. I will try and stick to the 20 -ish, 30 minutes that I have um, and tell you all about my PhD, which is a process evaluation of a family planning intervention that we're offering for young people aged 16 to 24 years old um, within the Chiaza trial intervention that is in Zimbabwe. So I'll just give us a brief background of the family planning situation in Zimbabwe. Um, so Zimbabwe actually has one of the highest uh, modern contraceptive prevalence rates in sub-Saharan Africa, but this works for women who are married or in partnerships. And then when you actually break down the unmet need for family planning by, by age amongst adults and girls and young women, as well as unmarried status, you'll see, for example, at the very bottom that unmet need continues to increase. So there's a really huge gap in terms of um, young, sexually active, unmarried women accessing family planning services in, um, in Zimbabwe. And that also then translates to the fact that we actually have one of the highest um, teenage pregnancy rates in sub-Saharan Africa. So some of the barriers to access, I won't go into them into detail, include um, judgmental health providers, the um, kind of sociocultural expectations around proving fertility, the value and demand for children, and also just more at a health facility level, the fact that only 5% of um, the 1,500 health facilities have been trained in youth friendliness. This is improving now. Um, but when I started my PhD, that's the data that was available. And also the fact that I think only about 3% of young people re report actually receiving family planning information when they visit public health facilities. So these are some examples of some of the barriers to access that young people face uh, when they're trying to access family planning services. So to respond to some of these barriers that young people face in HIV and sexual and reproductive health, where family planning is part of SRH, um, we came up with the Chiedza um, intervention. So Chiedza is a trial that is being implemented in three provinces in Zimbabwe, Harare, Blowayo, and Mashonaland East. It is community-based, it is youth-friendly, and it offers an integrated package of HIV and sexual and reproductive health services. And this package of services includes um, HIV testing and counseling, and then we have linkage to care and HIV care and treat people who are HIV positive, as well as adherent support services. For the sexual and reproductive health services, we're offering family planning, which will be the basis of my PhD. And then we're also offering SIT, STI testing and management. We're offering menstrual health products, um, information and management, condoms, as well as um, general health counseling for young people who want to come in and talk to us about any issues that they may have. These photos are some examples of just the way that our community centers are set up. So we work out of community centers. The bottom left, we have little health booths so young people can enter and access all the services they need with one health provider, except for a few services where the nurse has to come in, so they will have to move. So that's kind of our integrated model. 
Um, this is pre-COVID, so we had social activities where they could come and play pool, dots, music, television, um, and this was mostly done as a way of attracting young men so they could come and access services. So that's just a description of the Chiedza service itself and the family planning intervention I'll describe a little bit further in this presentation. So the aim of the Chiedza trial is actually to investigate the impact of community-based delivery of HIV and SRH services to 16 to 24 years old on a population level um, on population level HIV outcomes. So the primary outcomes for the Chiesa trial are actually the um, are actually HIV outcomes and then the SRH services are meant to be trying to improve um, HIV outcomes themselves. And so the objectives of the trial, like I already said, the first one is um, around our primary primary uh, outcomes, and then we're also conducting a mixed methods process evaluation of the Chiazza intervention, and then um, I'm a part of that team, and then my PhD specifically focuses on process evaluation of the family planning intervention within Chiazza. We're also doing a cost effectiveness um, study, and then we have the prevalence survey that's happening after two and a half years of implementation. So so the trial is starting to wrap up. We had a staggered start where Harare started first and then three months later, Blawayo started and then three months after that, Mashonaland East started. Uh, so implementation ended in Harare um, at the beginning of September. So the prevalence survey in Harare has actually uh, begun and is expected to take about three months. And I think it's supposed to be what the largest adolescent health survey in Africa. Uh, so the teams are on the ground and they've already started that, whilst implementation is, is wrapping up in the other two provinces. So this is just an example of the client flow. This is pre-COVID of what happens when our young clients come to see us at the community centers. Um, they will enter a reception. Their first point of contact is usually a young person. So we have youth workers who are kind of responsible for uh, screening and eligibility um, when young people come to the centers. And then once you're eligible, you then move to the common area, which is the photos that I showed you where they are playing pool and dots. And then the help booths, which are the mini tents, are usually also in that common area. So a young person can move from kind of the social activities into the health booth when it's their turn. And then once they're in the health booths, like I say, they meet with a community health worker and you get all of your services from that one provider, except for certain services that have to be done by the nurse. So, for example, the first consultation for family planning or if it's STI um, physical assessments that need to be done. And then there's a separate booth as well for the private counselor because these are usually longer um, these are usually longer consultations, so there's kind of a very specific boots uh, for that. So um, just from my description, I think we can start to realize how complex um, the Chiazza trial is. It's a complex intervention, and there are many components that are going on at the same time uh, with a lot of interactions and interdependence amongst multiple stakeholders, whether it's the people who supply our commodities, whether it's the... Um, uh, the clinics that we have to, to work with. So we have to take the art, for example, for our young people living with HIV from the clinic because they technically cannot be taken out of the national system. So we have a lot of partners and stakeholders that we work with. Um, and because of that, we know that randomized control trials really just measure the impact of the intervention. Did the intervention work? But for us to really understand which parts of the intervention are working or are liked or accepted by our young people as well as our providers or the community, uh, we need to go a little bit further than that. And this is where process evaluations come in. So I want to go into the process evaluation of the Chiedza intervention as a whole. Like I mentioned, I'm part of that team, but I'll just focus specifically on the process evaluation of the family planning intervention, which is my PhD. So the family planning intervention in Chiedza, um, as intended, we wanted to offer mixed methods contraceptives for young people, so both long-acting and short 
and short-term methods um, housed within an integrated model of HIV and sexual and reproductive health services, in part because um, it's one of those sensitive issues and things. So we wanted young people to be able to come to the Chiadza centers and and when they left, nobody could really tell what kind of services they had come for. So privacy and confidentiality was really, really important to us. So the intervention as intended was to do that, to have a choice of contraceptive methods and information being given to young people. We wanted our providers to have knowledge of and be trained in family planning so that they could adequately support our young people. And then the client pr provider relationships, so for them to be completely non-judgmental for young people who are coming to access family planning services, and then also an appropriate constellation of services, which is kind of the integration component. So if somebody comes for family planning, then they can be tested for HIV, get condoms, get MHM, um, get tested for STI, that kind of thing. So uh, for the process evaluation itself, um, I've been using the MRC process evaluation guidance framework with additional components from other frameworks. You'll see that in the next slide. And the MRC um, process evaluation guidance basically looks at implementation, what was delivered and how, at mechanisms of change, which is about the experiences of the participants and beneficiaries and how this may lead to change, as well as contexts. Um, a very blatant example would be COVID-19 in terms of context. Um, so the aim of my PhD is really to describe and understand the effects and or unintended consequences of the family planning intervention in Chiedza and to inform transferability and future implementation of the family planning model if the intervention shows plausible effectiveness. So to do this, I've already said I'm using implementation mechanisms of change and context as the framework at which I am investigating um, the family planning intervention. So for implementation, I'm looking at basically how the family planning intervention was delivered, the coverage, and also assessing fidelity of the intended intervention. So did we did we implement the intervention in the way we said we wanted to, um, to implement it? And then for mechanisms of change, I'm exploring the family planning, the experiences and perspectives of both the Chiazza clients and providers looking at differentiated access, as well as the effect of the intervention via participants' expectations and perceptions of it. And context, of course, is to identify and assess the influence of contextual factors and how these contribute um, to implementation and mechanisms of change of the family planning intervention. Um, so at the very, very big, I think I had to defend why I wanted to do my PhD. I created a logic model that really just tries to describe the family planning intervention as intended so that it was very clear to me and the rest of the team that we understood um, what we thought the activities should be that would result in the outcomes that we wanted to see for the family planning intervention. And this is really to guide uh, more my implementation objective um, and manuscript uh, so that we could be able to tell the story and whether we stuck to this logic model or if it actually changed by the time the, um, the trial ended. In a nutshell, this is my PhD and a diagram. Um, so you can already see that the, I, I'm sticking to my kind of three process evaluation domains of implementation, mechanisms of change, of context. Um, I'll just go through maybe some of the things that I've had to change um, in the next couple of slides, mostly because of COVID-19. So for example, quality um, had to change. I'll describe that in the next slide when I talk about some of my data collection methods, but dose, for example, also had to change a bit because we were not able to implement the way Chiedza, um, the family planning intervention, the way we'd envisioned doing it before. So some of the things were um, affected by contextual factors that were a bit outside of our control. Um, so my methodology, this is just a sample. So I basically have a table for each one of my objectives of implementation mechanisms of change and 
uh, and context. And then I have the research questions. These are the same as what you just saw in the diagram before, as well as what my data sources would be. So for example, because of COVID-19, I was not able to do focus group discussions and mystery client visits. Um, mystery clients, I wanted to use them to assess quality. So initially I wanted to have young women who are already coming to Chiesa to access family planning. This would have worked for young women who are either on the depot injectable or on oral contraceptives because the assumption is they will come back for a refill after three months. So the idea was to recruit some of these young women who are already family planning clients at Chiesa and then have them come back at their next visit, we can use that as a mystery client visit. And I would train them and talk with them and meet with them after that consult and visit um, to, to get data about what that, that, that experience was like. Uh, but COVID happened and all my ethics boards asked me to completely remove mystery clients, any mention of mystery clients from my protocols, uh, because the idea of having people move back and forth, they were extremely uncomfortable with. And the same with focus group discussions. So my PhD has been a lot of interviews and the non-participant observations and um, the quantitative data from the trial, as well as the meeting notes from the meetings that we have to discuss trial progress. But this is just an example. I won't go into the other objectives, but this is just an example of how I have um, structured my data collection um, in 2020 and 2021. Um, so this is, I'm doing, my analysis is a mixed methods um, process evaluation. So we have the routine data that's collected every time that young people enter the health booths to speak to their community health workers. We collect their demographic data as well as the services that they came for. So for family planning, we would also be collecting the um, kinds of contraceptive they've taken up, if they've only taken up uh, family planning information, if they've switched their family planning at some point, um, that information is collected. The information that I haven't been able to collect just from the way that the routine data is collected is for young women who are already on family planning, especially those who are on long um, long-acting reversible contraceptives. We don't have anywhere in our system where we can record that. So I might be under-representing actually family planning use within the young people who stay in our cluster communities. So that routine data then is then supported with the qualitative data um, that I've been collecting and we'll, we'll, we'll get into the data that we've collected, I think, in the next slide. Um, initially, I thought that I would be able to kind of analyze my quantitative data, um, what is it, not almost in real time, but as I was collecting the qualitative data, but they're a bit separate right now. Um, but, but the debrief meetings that we have with the teams also include um, data data presentation so we we report on the data that's been collected it's a once a month meeting and that has helped me shape some of my qualitative inquiries so for example at some point we were seeing a spike in um, uptake of long-acting reversible contraceptives so i then went into the field to really talk to young people about um method choice and how and how they make the decision to take up either short term or long acting reversible contraceptives. So that's how the, it's kind of been iterative. But in terms of actually writing it up, um, I'm going to have a fully quantitative paper and then my qualitative papers themselves. Uh, this is a busy slide, but this is what my data looks like right now. Um, I, I've had phases of data collection. I spent a good chunk of last year in the field collecting data. Um, so I've collected data with, with the providers. I won't go into, into detail of everything, but for example, in April 2020, this was um, right after we got into lockdown and COVID was happening. So they had to be phone interviews and we had interviews with the providers and uh, basically trying to understand from the from them the lead up to COVID-19 and the experiences there, as well as just their ability or not um, to provide commodities, so family planning commodities for young people in the lead up to, to lockdown. So, so yeah, so, so it's been an iterative process and it's been quite emergent. Uh, I've spoken to young people, I've done interviews with young people, interviews with 
providers again. Um, and then right now we're currently collecting interviews with support from a research assistant in Zim, uh, kind of the last batch of interviews for my PhD uh, with the providers. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, Chiesa trial is now tapering out, at least the implementation phase. So I really want to understand that over the two years, how have providers experienced implementing um, our family planning um, delivery model, especially because we had to change it. So an example I'll give is we were not able to train our providers to be able to provide long acting reversible contraceptives just due to um, more government supply challenges than anything else. So we had to partner with another organization to do this, but this really impacted dose because this organization have their own agenda, they have their own timelines, they can't always be available to show up on the days that we are offering Chiazza services. So really to, uh, trying to understand from the providers how they felt about getting this half training, not being able to provide the full services in-house, even though the organization we are working with would come to our centers. So trying to understand whether the, the, this model that we ended up doing was actually working or not. So that's the last batch of data that's been collected so that I can be able to fully answer my implementation questions. So my PhD is by publication. So uh, like Alicia said, I'm in writing analysis mode right now. Um, and this is what they, they look like uh, at the present moment. Um, I had one paper on HIV self-testing. I think that just got published in September. So that's not directly related to, um, to my PhD because it's focused on family planning. But some of the findings uh, from the HIV self-testing um, paper around just the complex decision making that young people go through, especially when they have a range of choices, um, as well as their desire for um, quality service provision for non-judgmental providers. Uh, that's also just as relevant even to family planning. So this paper might be an annex in my PhD versus actually being a chapter. And then I submitted two manuscripts in September. Uh, one on the interrupted access. So this is number two. This is more on COVID-19 and family planning um, that that using interviews that we had with young people and providers in Chiazza. And then number three was centered more on the family planning experiences and needs of young people living with HIV within Chiazza. Um, and then number four, five, and six are the ones that I am currently uh, working on right now. So in the last couple of slides, I'll just share some of the findings from the papers. I'll share some of the challenges that I'm having with manuscript number four, um, and then I will end the presentation. Uh, so like I mentioned in the HIV self-testing paper, some of our key findings were really about listening to young people so we can improve um, engagement in testing. This one is already out, so you guys can find it somewhere on the internet. <laughs> and, then, um, and then just the idea that a lot of our young people didn't want HIV testing, right? So we all, um, there's been this drive for uh, using HIV self-testing and a lot of young people, and there's a lot of research and evidence that says that, you know, it's the future and it's the way forward. But in Chiedza, when we started, I think less than 2% uh, were taking up take-home HIV self-testing. And they have an option of testing with the provider, testing in a private booth at our community centers, or taking the the self-test home and taking the self-test home had the lowest uptake. So we then went uh, in to explore qualitatively why this was happening. And for them, it was very much if I have the option of a provider who's not going to judge me, who's going to support me, I would rather have that than go have self-testing without any kinds of support. So that's what that paper is about. And then the COVID-19 and family planning paper. So we basically started by describing uh, what young people liked about Chiedza before COVID, and then we track uh, and then we report on access and use of family planning uh, during COVID. Uh, the trial had to close for six weeks um, in in April to May. So, kind of what were young people doing when we were closed, and then as well as after we reopened from May. 
um, and how COVID-19 kind of um, impacted their their access and use of family planning. So that's what this that paper is about. It's under review right now. Um, and then the third paper is, like I mentioned, is on family planning experiences of young women living with HIV. And for the young women in Chiadza, for them, it was what works for um, using and accessing family planning for them is really the fact that the Chiazza intervention right now sees them as more than their HIV diagnosis. A lot of these young people that we're seeing who are living with HIV were actually vertically transmitted. So they've kind of gone through their HIV care either from pediatric care and then having to move to adult HIV adult HIV services. And then we realized that both in pediatric care services and um, adult HIV care services, there isn't really a focus on the SRH needs of these young people, right? It's very HIV centered um, and they don't get those, that youth friendly quality sexual and reproductive health services. Um, so a lot of them just really kept saying that this is this is kind of the first service and the first intervention where I'm more than just my HIV diagnosis and some of my sexual and reproductive health needs can be addressed and supported. So that's also under review now. Um, and then I'm currently working on the fourth paper, um, which is a bit messy, but I'm writing it right now, which is really um, my initial draft was centered around social norms theory, around pregnancy, sex, fertility, and contraceptive use. And then when um, we had a discussion with my supervisors, they suggested that maybe I use the theory of candidacy to explore social norms, rules, and realities around the same issues. In part because a lot of the findings, um, I think the only social norm that was coming out was just the idea of proving fertility. Um, but all the other issues around like the misconceptions on the side effects of fertility or the fact on the side effects of contraceptives or the fact that a lot of the young women were saying that we want um, that you're expected to get married first, have a baby and then start using contraceptives. That's more like a moral cord than actual social norm. Um, so I'm now currently working on reworking that part. Um, to see if I can tell a clearer song of, of, of some of these findings that, that young people experience. And it just leads, I think part of my discussion will focus on how a lot of times we can have interventions that are working um, for young people that, that when they come, so for example, for Chiazza, when they come to the community center, it's an intervention that works, but they're only there for a few hours hours or even minutes, and then they go back into their communities and the intervention doesn't necessarily have any influence over what's happening in the communities. And young people are using a lot of what's happening to them or the information that they're getting from women they trust in their communities to make decisions about when they come to Chiedza. Um, so my discussion section might probably talk a bit um, about that and then maybe bring in how like social norms theories has resulted in change changes in behavior um, based on kind of this disconnect, but it's still a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. and then these are my two last manuscripts that I will write um, probably in Q1 and Q2 of next year. So the fifth manuscript is really just about um, how we've implemented the Chiazza family planning intervention. And I've been giving um, little bits of that during this presentation. So that manuscript would really be centered on implementation. And then number six, like I said, when I was describing my analysis plan, um, that I'm going to have a full quantitative uh, paper that just analyzes the quantitative data that we have uh, on family planning uptake within Chiazza. Um, this is my stretch goal, I think, for my PhD. I, I don't know if you can tell from this presentation that I'm a qualitative researcher, um, but I really want to get the, the quantitative skill of being able to analyze messy data um, and tell a story using uh, some of the qualitative findings that I have. Thank you for listening to my TED talk. Thank you so much, Connie.
That was really interesting and really great. And there's some hands in the bottom. I don't know if you can see them. <laughs> some, rounds, some virtual rounds of applause. Thank um, you. Thanks very much. That Yeah, that was really fantastic and very interesting to hear about your work. And also it gives nice context to the broader um, the broader projects as well. So I think for those of us that don't know about the Chiedza trial, it, it gives more information and we'll certainly be looking out for it um, and, and your publications. So I'm going to open um, this up for questions. So is there anyone that has a question um, that they would like to ask Connie, if they can raise their hand or unmute themselves? So there's one from, um, is it Panyo or Mulangeni? I can't see, but you can go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Connie. I'm very, very impressed and good to see you after all these years. I wanted to just ask, I think a more general question, <clears throat> what, ha what is the difficulty in setting up such a trial? And I, maybe I missed the beginning among young people in, in that setting of um, resource constrained countries. I know, for example, my own country in Namibia, we've never even had a single trial. And I don't know if that because of the legislation is not really there, or is it the population is too small? So I wanted, and I think you did speak a little bit to that, but <coughs> your experience and also for you as a, as a researcher there, thank you, like, yeah. And how it can be replicated to other countries, or if it cannot, obviously, what can we learn from your, your particular trial for the rest of our um, Southern African, um, African countries? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so we had support, I think, from every stakeholder um, in Zimbabwe. The ministry was really supportive in helping us set up the trial. Um, and, and it's a well-funded trial, so that helps. I think uh, once we figured out our budget and what we wanted to do um, and what was feasible. So we had, we had a, a formative research that we did, and then we also piloted the trial so that we could really work out some of these um, these challenges themselves. Um, but one thing, for example, that changed, for example, the government had said they would provide the commodities for us. Um, and then very early on, we realized that was not going to happen, um, in part just because of their own systems and how they track what commodities are out and being given, um, and sometimes too because of uh, shortages in the commodities. So we had to rework the budget and start procuring our own commodities. Uh, versus getting them for free from the government. So so that was maybe one main challenge that, that we had at the very beginning of the trial. But I think when you have buy-in from the stakeholders that I invested in, um, in the project that you're trying to do, it's, it's a bit more uh, just working out logistics to see if it works or what works and what doesn't work. So yeah, starting it up wasn't... Um, yeah, the challenges weren't in like it's it's resource constrained or whatever. We we managed to we managed to to start on on schedule. Uh, got extension because of COVID nineteen. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Connie. That's great. There's a question from Virginia in the chat, um, and, and it's it's quite a practical one, but I think useful. She's asking how you funded your open access publication because it's part of your PhD um, and whether the project funded it or the institution funded it. Um, because we we have some challenges with with PhD students that don't have large amounts of funding and how they they fund open access publication and then I see that there's two hands I'll, I'll come to you after that okay yeah so I am I am I think I'm pretty fortunate in my funding for my PhD so I'm an NIH um, Trent Fogarty fellow um, so two things. I think we had one paper, the HIV self-testing paper, actually. Initially, the uh, Wiley system didn't pick it up as open access, and they asked me to pay. But then when we reached out to LSHTM, they have a uh, agreement, I think, um, with Wiley. So it was they were able to then pick it up, and it was processed, and we didn't have to pay anything. I think LSHTM pays a chunk of money. Um, um, for them to be able to publish for us. But then my PhD fellowship had also said there is funding. So for example, if I end up publishing some of my papers in um, non-open access journals, 
um, there is some funding that they will actually pay for them. Um, so I just asked and they said they would support it. So I'm, I think I'm in a bit of a different um, situation, but I do understand that challenge. Thanks, Connie. So next I have Limakatso and then Sarah. So Limakatso, do you want to go ahead with your question and then I'll move to you, Sarah? Hi, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, for a great presentation, Connie. I'm not sure if I missed it, uh, but I didn't hear much about uh, fidelity to the program and what adaptations were done uh, due to the COVID-19 or in general to the from the original design uh, of the uh, program. So yeah, your fidelity and adaptations. Sorry if I missed it, but I think, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I briefly, briefly mentioned it. We we had to adapt. So maybe I'll just give a summary of the adaptations in Chiedza um, and then adaptations in the family planning if they were if they were any different. So because of COVID-19, for example, we had to remove the social activities part, which has actually really impacted our male engagement. We were already struggling bringing young men in to come access services, but the complete removal of social activities has made it even more challenging. Um, and we've spent the entire implementation of Chiedza trying to um, adapt and figure out how we can prove male engagement. The Chiedza intervention, the way it was set up was always with the intention to adapt. So our adaptations are actually not, um, what do you call it, deviating from fidelity because we said we would improve as we go along. So at every time when we are then looking at fidelity, it's always fidelity to the adapted version. And then we kind of track what adaptations we are um, we are giving into, we're putting into the intervention. A simple example I'll give for um, male engagement. One of the things that young men were telling us was that uh, there's a lot more commodities for young women, right? So young women can come get uh, family planning products, menstrual health products, as well as the condoms that we give to young men, whereas young men can only access condoms. So about uh, maybe three months ago now, um, we then added vouchers for young men where they can come get a voucher to go to the barber to get their hair cut, as well as boxer shots. Yeah, they told us they wanted boxes. So we're giving them boxes um, in response to that. So that's the way. And then we will then measure, are we remaining um, in fidelity to offering this adapted version? Um, so, so yeah, so with COVID-19, I think the biggest changes were really just the social activities um, and the fact that now we were asking them to wait in line. So it took on a bit of the clinical feel that they really didn't want when we were doing the formative research for um, for Chiedza, but it was a bit out of our control because of COVID-19. It didn't necessarily reduce the young people were seeing. I think in I think that it, the reason why they kept coming though was not because of and back because of the fact that um, we remained to be, we remained youth friendly and our services are free and we remained open uh, outside of those six weeks. So there were then other drivers for continued engagement, even though we had removed some of the parts that we'd put in to encourage engagement. For the family planning intervention, um, I mean, it was affected by COVID-19 and the fact that Chiedza was affected by COVID-19. But like I mentioned very early on that um, we'd wanted our providers to be the one to offer the full range of um, contraceptive methods, but they were not able to because we were they couldn't get the full training, the practical training for family planning where a provider has to be supervised uh, either inserting 10 implants or 10 um, IUCDs. Uh, under the supervision and only then can they do it independently and we were not able to do that because there was a national national shortage of commodities in Zimbabwe and none of the partners who usually offer long acting reversible con contraceptives were willing to let go of commodities for quote unquote training purposes so then we had to partner with an organization one unintended consequence that has resulted because of that is long waiting times, which we all know young people don't like. So because a young person has to access your other services and then go to the booth for this organization for their um, implant or IUCD, which is quite a long consult, they end up spending quite a bit of time at the community centers and um, they've raised that in their interviews. 
Yeah. Thanks, Connie. Sarah, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, thanks so much. Connie, this was like an awesome presentation. I really appreciate how you <laughs> broke everything down, especially I'm a master's student. So it's like nice being able to conceptualize how, how this whole thing works. Um, and one of my questions is, or earlier you had mentioned that there, um, one of the goals was attitudinal shift um, among healthcare workers um, to be able to provide family um, family planning services. And I'm just wondering how, um, if a particular intervention was done, a training, particularly in light of um, the other adoptions y'all had to make because of COVID. Thanks. Um, thank you. So, so our providers got um, training in youth friendliness um, very early on when they were starting on. And actually part of this whole youth friendliness what should I call it, sector of the trial, um, included uh, we had young people be involved even in the recruitment of our providers. So they sat on the panels with us, they did role plays um, as young people with the providers um, and their, their opinions and what they thought of all of the um, providers we interviewed was really, really taken into, into consideration. And then our providers had to do a two week training at the beginning of the trial um on 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 youth friendliness and what it means and some of the challenges and things that come up um and then even when we started implementing for example we continued to uh what is it give more training so for example we had training uh for lgbtqi we had other providers who very bluntly told us that i'm not doing this and like walked out of training um, because it was completely against what they believed in um, and we had to deal with that uh, so, so yeah, so so those were just some of the things that that we had to do, and some of the attitudes that they had to do. I had an interview, for example, with um, one of our providers who was basically saying that um, I think it had to do with a young person, a young woman who wanted um, to use contraceptives, and she was unmarried, and she has a boyfriend, and um, and he basically convinced her to take condoms instead, which is not what she wanted, right? And he was quite open. He's like, I think, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing that. But I realized that I'm also a person in a community um, impacted by norms and expectations and what we think young people could be doing. Um, and that unexpectedly also came up. So, so there isn't a fixed formula to uh, to all of that. It was just continued training. Um, our meetings with the providers, I think every month really, really helped because they were also able to share some of the challenges they might face um, and how, and then others would respond on how they would deal or how they've dealt with certain issues um, or situations if they were challenging. Um, but the one thing I think you'll see even when all the other chairs of papers start being written out was the one thing that's been consistent with our young people is our providers. Um, so part of what we are doing in the broader process evaluation is really trying to unpack what makes a youth friendly service provider mm -hmm. and how is that the same or different for different kinds of young people, right? So the example I gave for young people living with HIV, for them it was very much, for them youth friendliness is being seen and understood as more than being HIV positive. That could be completely different for a young person who comes for um, STI treatment, for example, or someone who's just coming for condoms. So we're really trying to break down instead of just saying young people want youth friendliness. What does that actually look like and mean from their perspective? Um, so we'll probably be publishing on that as well. Thanks, Connie and Sarah for your question. Um, there's another question in the chat from Monica, which is asking about service integration and whether that already exists or whether it was something that was part of the trial. Uh, it was something that, that was part of the trial. So we do have other programs in, in Zimbabwe that um, do integration in, in different formats, right? So you could think of dreams, for example. Um, and and other partners, uh, but for us it was it was part of the trial. So being uh, you saw in my very very first slide, being community based, integrated, and youth friendly um, were things that we're actually trialing to see if they are going to improve HIV outcomes at the population level. Great. Are there any more questions or hands? Anyone have anything that they want to add? Otherwise, I have a quick question. 
Um, I don't see any, any, so I'm going to take the opportunity to ask my question. So, Connie, you've talked a lot about um, the flexibility and changes in terms of the project and also your PhD as a result of COVID-19, but I want to ask kind of a personal reflective question and, okay. and, and what, what COVID-19 has taught you about flexibility in research. Yeah. Um, I was bummed that I couldn't use mystery clients. I was really, really looking forward to engaging with that and even like writing a um, methodological focused paper on, on mystery clients. Um, but I think what, what COVID-19 really taught me is like to, to adapt. I mean, it, it sounds like a very simple um, thing to, to be taught, but it's being really, really open to my PhD shaping out to be a little bit different. Um, I think I had a bit of a bit of understanding of that by the fact that I was doing a process evaluation. So there's a bit of you know what's coming and then you also don't know what's coming and then you you kind of have to evaluate that. Um, but to really, really be open to the process of things going in a different direction, I think I ended up deciding early on to really just respond to my data. So I was very, very intentional about analyzing my data as I went along and ensuring that it was feeding into the next phase of my data collection um, versus, for example, um, other students might just have, I have three phases of data collection for my three objectives and I'm sticking to that. And I became a bit more open around what is what is the data um, telling us and how do we continue to, to explore it further so that we don't end up being uh, superficial. I have a lot of data. I don't know if I would encourage people to collect as much data as I did, but, um, but it was part of that iterative iterative process because some things just felt like they needed to be explored more so adapt be very yeah. open to changing this is the moral of the story so oh, and I think it's a really useful skill for all of us as researchers and I mean I think COVID has, uh, has um, forced us all to become more flexible and adaptable but I think uh, especially in terms of a PhD or longer term project there's often um unanticipated things that happen and we have to be flexible and adaptable and, and it's not always easy and, and I, I speak from experience but I also know from PhD students that I'm working with at the moment that they really have had to struggle with it but I think that's that's also part of kind of planning for that um, unanticipated change as well and kind of knowing that it that it may happen um, is really useful to yeah. think about. So are there any other questions? Um, or anything that people want to add? If not, I think we can end. I don't see anyone's hands or anyone unmuting. Connie, thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. It was lovely to hear about the trial and more broadly, but also about your own research. And we look forward, to, we will um, on the, the uh, social and behavioral science, Vula site, share some of your published papers. Okay. And I'm sure I speak for everybody who was interested and excited about your research that will be looking out for your other publications and um, yeah. look forward to, to reading them. And good luck with the, the final stage final stages. And for those of you that are interested in chatting to Connie, she's here until I think it's the beginning of December. Is that right, Connie? Yeah, I leave at the, on the 26th of November. Yeah, so, so Connie's here for the next send. month. Um, yeah. And she's around. She's sometimes on the third floor. So if people are interested and want to want to chat, then um, reach out um, and take advantage of, of her being with us. But thank you, Connie, and thank you, everybody, for your interesting questions. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. And um, we'll see you again for noon meetings, I think. I'm right in saying that this is the last one. So we'll see you again next year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks very much, Connie. Bye. Bye.